we're going to start out with Senator Gaddy's bill. So Senator Gaddy's bill is uh, 129 with regard to foster care children. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, this issue, uh, it's a big problem, it's a big deal. It was brought to my attention uh, last summer at a, at a party. We were talking to some foster parents, and they let me know that even though a foster child may have been in foster care since they were an infant or a teenager, that once the clock strikes on their 18th birthday, they're, they're turned away. Uh, there's no more funding from them. And as, as you all know, many people turn 18 their senior year of high school. Uh, my daughter turned 18 this year uh, in January, and she had February, March, April, and May left to finish school. I cannot imagine if someone such as my daughter Catherine had, been, had to go find another school and, and do those things. But, but then it's deeper than that because a lot of the kids are in foster care. They have issues that they're dealing with. And they don't graduate on time, a lot of them. In fact, we've identified between 140 to 180 kids a year that age out of the system prior to graduation. And, and the secretary can correct me if those numbers are wrong. So let's talk about where those kids end up that age out. About 20% of them end up in prison or in some type of incarceration. About 25% end up homeless. And what that means is that we end up paying more for them where they end up than if we were just to do what this bill asked for and to extend what is considered uh, to be the best practice at this point for foster kids to extend their care to 21 or until they graduate from high school. So what this bill does is it looks at that gap problem and it, and it corrects it and my bill simply asks that the, the child remain uh, funded by the state until they graduate or attain the age of 21. Because by that point, we've found that they've learned a job skill, they've gone through goodwill training, they've had the time to get a GED, they've had a family to love on them, and you're going to hear some testimony today from some families and, and some children that I hope will help us understand the, the severity of this issue. Uh, there is an amendment, though, just for procedural purposes. During the, during the hearing in health and welfare, it was brought to my attention by uh, a former district attorney and a, and a child advocate who is an attorney, uh, Mr. Ducote. Uh, he brought to our attention just some problems that, that we may want to address if we move in this direction. Line 6 uh, says the department shall continue to provide to a person in foster care and to the person's foster parents all benefits and services the department's foster care program after the person's 18th birthday if the person is a full-time high school student uh, and, and so on. That just clarifies what we want to do. But that last line that says, upon written consent of the person and the foster parents, because we have an anomaly that happens on the 18th birthday, even though this child can, needs care, they're no longer considered a child by our law. Uh, oh, that's right, yeah. So, so Mr. Chairman, and, and it was an epiphany to me, too. Uh, he was the last one to testify because, as you know, when you get assigned to represent a child or a parent in these uh, child in need of care cases, and ultimately if the child is deemed a ward of the state, uh, that's a juvenile court, and it's a juvenile ruling. So when they turn 18, they're no longer a juvenile, so that court no longer has jurisdiction, jurisdiction. nor does any order of that court. So th th this, this, this uh, paragraph A talks about the consent of both sides. Uh, paragraph B uh, says that the acceptance of the benefits and services shall in no way deprive the person formerly in foster care of any rights or obligations conferred by obtaining the age of majority. Uh, and that simply means a continuation of benefits, that if they were receiving A, B, and C from the department, the 18th birthday passes, they still receive A, B, and C until this new trigger or sunset date. Subsection C says the benefits and service prior under this section shall impose no obligation of reimbursement. Uh, there, uh, the attorney testified that there were some cases in other states maybe where reimbursement became an issue and we just didn't want the foster to parents in our state to, to, to hesitate at all uh, in, in signing up for this, for this uh, continued care. Uh, and that would, the, the subsection C takes care of that uh, 
issue that was brought up. Um, so, and so I guess said, an, an, an 18-year-old, I guess even in not foster care, could walk out the door at 18. Correct. Okay. And the same thing would be true of foster care. So to the extent that they would, the benefits would inure to, to that 18-year-old, uh, but the parents wouldn't consent, obviously, if the child would, if the young adult had left the home. And that's great. And, and, and the picture that we're looking at, though, is not, I'm 18, I'm leaving. Mom, Dad, I'm tired of being here. The picture that is really tragic is they don't want to leave. Johnny's in January. He's finally made it to where he's going to graduate this year. He turns 18. And the parent, typically a foster parent who's called by God to be a foster parent, they don't have the financial ability to do it. Okay, so they highly rely on uh, the the finances given by the state, and so when that child turns 18, the parent has to say, "I love you, but I can't care for you anymore." And, and there's some folks that will testify about that. But so so the age 18 is not some magic number, you know. Uh, I'm 43. I still call my mom and dad. You know, I still ask my dad for stuff. They still know? sending you money? Uh, well, you know, <laughs> I, only if I cry. All right. <laughs> If I pinch my leg hard enough, sometimes it works. But, 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 but really, you know, the, these children become a part of the family of the foster family, and and, and it, it, it's tough to think that the, the small financial award from the state is the straw that breaks the camel's back. And and, and we're going to hear testimony about that. That it really is uh, the heart of these folks. And when you're caring for a special needs foster student or a student that struggled with PTSD or things like that, they don't graduate on time. A lot of them don't. So th th that's just kind of with broad strokes uh, what the amendments do. And lastly, subpart D, um, it just further goes into consent. And every 90 days after until the child's 18th birthday, it just breaks it down a little bit more. So those are, I think that one is more technical than substantive. Well, like I said, I wasn't aware of it until you told us last week or the last couple of nights ago that this happens on a, not on a regular basis, just that's how it's structured, that they roll out and they're, and they're done. So, but even in regular, um, even under current statutes, uh, a divorced set of parents, they are obligated to take care of that child and provide child support until their eight, uh, until graduation from high school. Currently, under current law, that's right. And so, if you have a, and, and if you have a special needs child of that marriage that ultimately ends in a divorce, it's lo it's, it's forever. It's part of child support that yeah. that they must maintain that child. Uh, with health insurance or any benefits that they were accustomed to during the marriage so so with non foster parents the obligation uh, i say the state's obligation to substitute for the missing parents and by supporting the foster parents terminates at 18 but it that, doesn't terminate for anybody else that's great mr chairman and that's why i think a lot of us when we when we visit with foster kids and we talk about it we think well they're going to get the care till the care is no longer needed that's what i always like, assumed yeah like title 9 and child support for regular families, but th that is not true. And when I found this out, uh, you know, it, it's it's devastating because it, this is not the nuclear family where the child walks out at 18 and says, I'm gonna join the Marine Corps, I'm leaving. You know, this is, sorry, honey, I can't pay for you to be here anymore. And the state's not gonna help you anymore. You don't have the skills to live. And they're finding these kids in laundromats that they're finding them in sex trafficking they're, because these are the weakest among us you yeah. know and so uh clearly people that are not choosing not to help themselves they just don't have the resources to help themselves right. and they're finding through other states that have extended to 21 that we all know that something magical happens in the brain between 18 and 21 you know and 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 in men sometimes later than women you just start thinking differently about life and you're more open sometimes to advice and to caring that's me being married to a psychologist that's what she tells me but uh, but, but 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 i think that's why it's 21 not 26 or 30 i think it's right. you know there's something magic about that time where children start to rely more on advice and not i know what's best for me and uh and this is, I mean, the foster, I mean, they're going from obviously unstable environment to a stable environment. That's correct. So they're already declared in need. And the, and the foster families have been vetted. And then, uh, you know, to turn them away just because a birthday happens, I think it's a, it's a tragedy. So. Just a side story. So I'm a prosecutor in New Orleans, right out of law school. My first, one of the first cases I got was a sex abuse case involving four siblings or five siblings. 
So uh, I won't go through the whole process about how they got discovered, but in the process of learning who they were and being able to have them feel comfortable about getting the testimony that I needed from them, because uh, they were four, six, uh, all the yeah, same age as the kids that I have in the back that are here today. Uh, I took them to McDonald's and we rode the streetcar and all this kind of stuff. And when I brought them back, and uh, when we left McDonald's, I noticed that they had not eaten all their food. And then I noticed that their backpacks, when I dropped them off, I had to tell non-foster parents, these were people from a local church that just basically found them. Their bags were filled with money, canned goods, all kinds of stuff. And I, I said, I don't, I, mean, I don't know what happened. They weren't interested in eating the food. And each of them said they do that all the time because they had been bounced around because the foster care, the system hadn't picked them up. The church had picked them up. Uh, and so they, they got moved around, and even at seven or eight, they had the wherewithal and instinctive uh, – they instinctively knew that they better prepare for the next move, which could be one week, three weeks. French fries, money, candy, all kinds of stuff in there. So anyway, uh, I'm glad you brought the bill uh, Well, that's, a, that's powerful, and we know that these children, when they turn 18, it's food, shelter. And, and, and that is why there's a, they're a high risk for sex trafficking. Yeah, because they're vulnerable and very yeah. vulnerable. They're vulnerable to ideas, and, and Senator Johns knows this from his extensive work in this area. I mean, they're vulnerable to these ideas. They're invulnerable to uh, negative peer pressure, and, and that's what we're going to. Uh, well, that's what I hope this bill fixes. I don't think every one of these foster children are going to consent to stay in the system. Right. Some of them may choose to leave. I guess. But I do think if we rebuild rebuild our system to where the children are seeing a, a benefit from being in foster care, which a lot of them do, uh, I think you will see more and more children saying, you know, I want to stay in this program towards graduation or learning a vocational skill between 18 and 21. And you're right, it's a lot more expensive if they end up going in the other direction. After the secretary speaks. Okay. So we have a, Madam Secretary, go ahead and begin, and then uh, Senator Alla and Senator Johns have yes, questions. Okay. Good, go ahead, Madam good Secretary. Good morning. Marquita Walters, Secretary of DCFS. Um, we'd just like to um, commend the Senator for bringing this bill and for recognizing the plight of what happens to children and youth in foster care. Many of them at 18 are so ready to leave us because of the experience they have had that they can't wait to go. On the other hand, there are many of those that have found loving, nurturing foster parents that want to stay and if the foster parent, as the senator said, if the foster parent has the resources, they may stay there until 18, but not with any support from us. Now, there, um, if you're looking for numbers, about 900 youth aged out of the system over the past five years. We used to have a program called the Young Adult Program that you may be familiar with that was um, deleted or stopped in 2013 because it was state general fund dollars and so it was an easy program to sweep when we started facing cuts back then. What we do have for youth is an independent living program. We refer these kids when they're 14 to independent living so that they can start building life skills, learning how to write checks, learning how to um, pay bills, learning what it costs to live, those kind of things. They can stay in that program until they're 18. And that's while they're in foster care and it's something they go to on weekends and nights or classes that they go to. If they are in school at 18, and they choose to stay connected to the independent living program, they can get federal dollars to finish school there, but they get no support from the state. Now the state funds those independent living programs, so we monitor them, we know how many kids are in them, we know, but we're not doing any case management. We're not, um, we're not really doing anything but just doing head counts. How many are still in the program? How many are going? We have an independent living program in every region of the state. And right now, um, I think there are about 90 kids in independent living that are over 18. So they have chosen to stay connected to that program that augments its money that it, they're funded by federal funds. So they're not getting any state general fund, but the contract is through us and they can augment their program 
many of them are 501c3, so they can augment their program in other ways. But so out of the 190, 200 kids that will age out this year, um, that shows you how many of them choose just to leave. But, but I mean, I'm assuming some of them, if they chose to stay and the foster parents weren't able to provide, then they have no, they don't choose. They just leave because they have no place to go. That is correct. So the, really the options are pretty limited. That is true. And we know from the research that we have done across the nation that raising the age even one year, even to 19, lets those kids that are um, being educated and in some kind of work program or high school program, even that one year gives a great deal of support to them. We recognize that there's a fiscal note attached to this mm -hmm. because we, we can't, I, I have told you and will tell you again soon when I come before you with my department budget, there's, there's not any margin. So this comes with a cost. We believe in it. We believe it should happen. We love the bill. We just know that it comes with a fiscal note. Of the ones that, would, of the ones that are truly choosing not to stay with their foster parents, uh, let me ask you this. How many of them would stay if they oh. – I'm assuming they feel some level of guilt if they're leaving and they have no financial support or the foster parents let it be known. I don't know how they deliver that message that – you, I don't know if you'll be able to stay after 18. I, I, I don't know. I guess there's no know. way to figure that out. I don't know. I could, I mean, we could try to ask some caseworkers, but I, I don't, we don't have any way of knowing that. Ready? Yes. All right, Senator, I'll answer some questions. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, look, I, I, I love the bill. I, I, think, I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, how did we come about the age 21? There are multiple states. I'll let the senator speak to his bill. There are multiple states. The feds raised the age to 21 okay. and gave the states the option of going to 21 if they wanted to, meaning that we can still draw down the 4E dollars, which is the bulk of the foster care money. We can still draw that down to 21 if we put up the state match. If you put up the state, okay. I see. I see. So, but what, so, what what I'm struggling with here, and and as you know, we we've got a whole list of people, including yourself, that's yes, going to come in front of us. This thing does have a fiscal note. Yes, sir. Uh, and and I'm struggling with where we're going to get the money. I mean, I, I love the bill. I want to do it, but to get money to you, I've got to take it from someplace else. I understand. You know, and our options aren't very good. When you're talking about now waivers and the disabled and, the, and a whole laundry list that, that I'm not going to bore you with, uh, I'm struggling where we get the money to do it. Uh, so there, you have to come up with the match. I'm looking at a million dollars a year, a state general fund, if I'm reading the, the fiscal note correctly. Uh, my um, Eric is here. I'm going to let him speak to how they came up with okay. the cost of that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested how you came up with the cost, and is there any way to – so there's no other funding besides state general funds to be able to do this. There's we no, would be drawing down federal funds. Right, and we in, would in be a match. Using, right, in a match. What is the match? Do we know? The match, a recurrent under secretary. The match is 4B, and the fiscal note indicates it's 25 percent state general funds, 75 Federal. We also so we put up 25 and 75. Exactly. We also use fund. SSBG, which is 100% state general fund, and there's 10% that would be 100% state general fund. So it's a blended financing. Okay, and they will allow you go to go all the way to 21. Yes. With that. Yeah. If if we if at the end of the day, if we can't, if we just can't find the money to make it go to 21, but maybe we could entertain. 19, 19 or 20. Uh, how does that affect the fiscal note? Do we know? Well, quite a bit. We're assuming that 80% of the kids, well, they're no longer kids, 80% of those who stay in the program will graduate the first year. Okay. You know, and then you have 20% the second year and 10% the third. So it would be an impact, but not. Not a, a huge big, impact. Exactly. The bulk of the money is getting them from 18 to 19. Exactly, 80%, basically. And I'll, I'll just say that, that it, 
if we lowered it, it would encourage families and students to work towards graduation because some there's just no hope they're going to graduate by 18. A lot of kids in normal households don't graduate at 18 just because of when they start school. I'd be okay with 19 or 19 and a half or however we wanted to figure it out because I think you're encouraging and you're, and you're lowering the fiscal note. But that's just my, my opinion. There may be someone wants to differ with that. And senators, it's important for you to know what we believe inside the department is we're not waiting until they're 17 to start working with these kids. Under Dr. Hodnett's leadership, we, we have tried to recraft the young adult program with no money inside the agency. So we're doing everything humanly possible inside with the resources that you have given us to start better serving these kids at 14 and 15 and 16 and making sure that no kid leaves us at 18 without a permanent connection. When Senator Gaddy referenced um, finding them in laundromat, unfortunately the night before this bill came before um, health and welfare, I had been in Covington the day before and they told me they found two young women. They had picked up two girls in a laundromat the night before that had aged out that day. That breaks our heart. None of us want that. And so we are doing everything possible with the staff that we have to make sure that not a single child leaves us without a permanent connection. But that permanent connection isn't always gonna have the financial resources to get that kid where they need to go. And I'm, I'm with the Senator. As long as my mother was alive, I called her for a lot. And um, I hate that these kids leave us without a family. Yeah. It, and it, I know you have really hard fiscal choices to make. This is a couple of million dollars to carry it for a year. I, and, you know, let's give it a try. It, can we uh, get the fiscal office? Yeah, this. Tanisha. If you, Ms. Morgan. Ms. Morgan from the fiscal office who can maybe Hi. Hey. Hey. Uh, can you tell us what the impact of of uh, reducing the age from twenty one down to something else would be on the fiscal note? The impact of reducing it down to 19 would just maintain the first year. So $3.8 million a year where $961 million would be general fund. That would be the most that you would pay if you would raise it up to 19. With the amendment, some kids may choose not to continue in the program, so it would reduce it depending on how many kids chose to stay in the program. But at most, um, with 80% of the kids staying into 19, it would still be $3.8 million a year, where about $961 million would come it from general cost. funds. So it, it, would, it would not impact the fiscal note. Does, does his amendments, do the amendments affect the fiscal note at all? Yeah, it would stay like this. I say, she she said nine hundred sixty one million and almost had a heart attack. Nine hundred sixty one thousand. Nine hundred sixty one thousand. No, I, I I knew the difference. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's because the bulk of the kids, eighty percent of them, will finish high school by nineteen, and the fiscal note assumes that eighty percent of them will continue. And then in the remaining years, there's like another ten percent for those who age out at twenty, and then another ten percent for those who age out at um, twenty one. But if you were to reduce it to nineteen. The line that you have, the first line here on the fiscal note for FY19 will continue out for the remainder of the years because that's capturing all of the eight, the 19 year olds. Okay. Mm -hmm. I get it. Okay. So that wouldn't, that wouldn't reduce the fiscal note in the first year, but in the, in the ensuing years, it, it may have some, some effect, but not dramatic because you only talk about 20 and 10, which would be 30% decrease right. in the ensuing years. Right, it would reduce it by about $1.2 million in those ensuing years. Okay. And even more if some kids decide not to participate with this amendment. But that's indeterminable. This is, would this would be, well, that's important to us. Right. That, that's the maximum it could cost us. That's the maximum. So really, the realistic number would be somewhat less of this. It would be somewhat less if some of those kids decide not to participate. But still indeterminable by, by y'all. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
I'm finished. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Did you have some more uh, folks that you want to have yeah, bring just, forward? I just want to make one point to, to Senator Allen's question is that there's, there's still going to be the, the societal numbers, though, the downside oh. on the 19-year-old that, that doesn't graduate, they still fall into the 20% that go to jail and 25% that are homeless. And so but I appreciate I'm, I'm, your concern. No, no, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm balancing all that in my mind, but I have the bill in front of me and the fiscal note in front of me, which is what we have to deal with. That also is a great point, but still it's, like the fiscal office says, indeterminable. Correct. We, we know that there's a cost, and it's probably more than offsetting. Uh, and, and I'll give you credit for that, but uh, I'll listen to the rest of the ter testimony. Thank you for bringing the bill. I think it's a worthy bill. Thank you, Senator. Wait, let me get uh, Go ahead, Senator. Uh, oh, Madam, wait. Okay, Madam Secretary, come on, come on back to the table for just a quick second. <laughs> yes, sir. Senator Gaddy, the best bill of the session. <laughs> Thank you. And I mean that. And, and, and I see so many positive outcomes that can come from this. I don't know if you're aware, and I want the members of this committee to be aware, that we lead the nation in foster care adoptions. Mm -hmm. So the longer we can keep them in foster care, there's always that glimmer of hope that some family is going to show up and say, I want you to be a part of my life permanently. And so we had that opportunity. You know my work on human trafficking, and the, you, you can keep them in a foster home instead of in a laundromat somewhere. Then there's just so many out, positive outcomes uh, on this. Um, Madam Secretary, I think there's a, a resolution moving through the system that's similar to this. Yes, sir. It happens to be Senator Barrows. It's a Senator study Barrow resolution. Senator Barrow has arrived. Okay. Has. She has a bill that is um, a study resolution for us to look at this very issue, um, to really deep dive into the research, to see what the research says, what the national best practices are. We actually have um, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, which is a um, national philanthropic organization that is here working with us that just came a few months ago and they are working on this issue with us on the youth that age out so they will be helping us um, bring in national experts for us to study this from every angle and look at what every other state that has raised the age where they've had successes where they didn't so that we can truly dig into this to figure out what's the very best way to treat this population. Um, so that is moving through the systems and it is a, um, a backup, I guess, if you will. It doesn't save the, the group that are turning 18 this year. Okay. Well, I, I hope that at, at some point in time we can find a financial solution to this and because uh, it's huge. I mean, yes, we're, we're talking about children. and. and and, and so anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you for your work. Thank you. And uh, you do incredible work, you and your staff. So thank you, Senator. Thank nice you, Senator, you. for bringing the bill. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Bill. Uh, Senator Fannin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of comments. Uh, one, I want to, and, and I'm assuming they'll come to the table, but I'll make those comments now. The parents that, that are willing to try to keep these children in school are to be commended, uh, whether <laughs> We, we have many hundreds of children today that's not 18 years old that's on our streets today that's done out of school and, and, and lost their way. That's a sad situation, but it's real in, in this state, and it creates more problems than, than we know. So I, the parents that are willing to try to keep those. I guess my question to you, Madam Secretary, one, when, a, when a, an individual gets 18 years of age, and, and they're no longer in school, whether they graduate or not. What are they, are they entitled to any other benefits from the state like welfare or food stamps or any of those things? Can you t come in a little bit? I, I'm, I'm asking that as a broad question, not just for, for foster kids, because I don't really know. They um, certainly most often meet the income threshold for, for food stamps, for the SNAP benefits. Um, I don't know what other benefits they might be getting. They're probably on Medicaid, so their health care is probably covered, and they would have a Medicaid card. Um, 
which of course we know is is what they might not be getting and one of the things that um, we're really worried about with the LDH budget and the shape it's in is the mental health services because that's under you know threat I don't know where that's going to come out in the wash and the um, very often the the substance abuse help many of our kids have a dual diagnosis you know they have a they have a um, mental health diagnosis as well as a physical and so those those kids need a lot of support and without an adult in their life that's helping make sure they stay on track and get that support then these are the kids that Senator Johns finds that in the human trafficking that they they're so easily swept up because somebody shows them affection and promises them something but, but but your comments in relation to those benefits that, that those are Ill, anyone eighteen that meet the threshold, not just foster Correct. children, but but Correct. anyone. Uh, and and maybe I should ask the uh, the parents this: Do you find the schools when if we're talking about twenty one? Understand the nineteen. I don't quite understand the twenty one. Do you find it difficult for for our public school systems to want to have children or to find a place for children? when they become 21 years old in, in the system? And, and, and you don't, you I don't, don't have to. I see I people can. shaking their head. Maybe they'll just answer that when okay. they come to the <laughs> table. So, and I appreciate it. That's all, Mr. Chairman. I was just curious as to what they might be eligible for. Yes, sir. And there yeah. may be other things out there that I'm unaware of, but certainly they would be eligible for those benefit programs. Senator Hewitt. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator and Secretary, thank you all for bringing this bill. I mean, I couldn't agree more with my colleagues that um, these are children that through no fault of their own are in the circumstances that they're in. And if ever there were a group of folks that we should be helping, it would be these children. And I have no doubt that the odds go up if they have a high school diploma of them getting on a positive track than if we age them out before they, uh, they have a chance to graduate. I know that it's more difficult to place those children that are near the 18 year old, you know, the older end of the age group. Mm -hmm. And so when you have them in a foster family, you want to keep them there because I think you, your odds of success go up. And so, you know, I believe that a million dollar fiscal note, if we cannot find a million dollars in a $15 billion budget, we will have failed miserably in this session. And so I'm very committed to working with you to try to find that. I do agree with your point, Senator, that um, one of the things that kind of is missing, I believe, and most all of our fiscal notes because it's difficult to quantify, is the cost of not doing something. Exactly. So you mentioned, you know, the, that quite often these um, children end up in prison on the streets in situations that you could probably say cost the state more in the long run than if we invested a little bit of money now. And it's really difficult to quantify that. But I, but I hope that, you know, we won't cut off our nose to spite our face, so to speak, and that we will um, work towards fiscal notes that try to look at the cost of not doing something, because I think in many cases, you know, we're kind of shortchanging ourselves and investing a little bit of money in the short term that would help us in the long run as a state. And this is one of those examples. And so um, for today, we're gonna have to it just intuitively, I think, recognize those benefits uh, but I want you to know that, that I definitely support this and that I will work to see if we can't find um, the funding to do this going forward. So thank you for bringing the bill. Thank you, Senator Hewitt. One of the, I would like you to um, understand that the statistics we have are national statistics about what happens with these kids and that data is pretty rich. We don't have any state data about where these kids go because we don't have capacity to track them. So we, um, several years ago, we did some kind of crosswalk between the number of foster kids that crossed over to the juvenile justice system and it was a shocking number. I don't remember it, but it was a shocking number. Um, and that was the only state data that we've ever gotten 
um, because once they leave our system, we don't know where they go, and so we don't track them at all. But we do know from the national data that the, the outcomes are, are not great unless they've got a stable, loving family. And that is what I think you all believe that every kid deserves. Every kid deserves a stable, loving family. That's, you know, what we all want for our kids. And for these kids who every time they move in school and every time they change placements, and many of our kids have multiple placements, they lose time in, in the actual grade level. So getting them to graduate at 18 is a mighty feat. So even the year to 19, I think, would really be very beneficial. And, and, and I am um, also very proud that, that the senator brought this bill. Well, I like the way the bill's written because it says, you know, whichever comes first, they graduate or they age, age out, whatever. And so I personally would support not lowering the age because I don't think it does you any good to age them out at 19 or whatever if they still haven't graduated from high school. I mean, to me, that is the, the milestone that we need to achieve. And so, you know, I would hate to cut them short because I don't think in the end you end up with better results if they didn't have a chance to graduate. So, you and know, I, I, I would agree with you on that. But, but you know, when, the, when, we, when we, we really kind of fleshed out the bill and what it would look like and anticipating the cost and anticipating the match, the 75% match, uh, this seemed like a good start uh, with the financial system situation that we're in as a whole but I do agree with you uh, what really pushed me on when you, know, when you take off your emotional hat you just look at the finances part of it I mean a lot of programs or a lot of uh, parts of the system that these children end up in when they age out we don't get a three to one match to help us with that problem and so even if the cost is even a million and a million I mean we're not getting four million dollars to pour into these children when they go off to be homeless or go off to prison. And so, so once again, I agree with you. A lot of times when we're looking at these notes on the bills, we don't know what that negative number is or the, 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 the data we need to say if we, if we don't do this, what's the cost? We always know what it costs to go to college, you know, but we don't know what it would cost our family if we didn't go to college and didn't get a degree. You know, the, those numbers are not as easily uh, defined. So, but the, the note is what it is, and we're in the times are that we're in. So, yeah, and I, and I appreciate your comments. I think it's worth, uh, this is a relatively small note for the level of benefit we're giving a highly sensitive population, and we know where this population is going to end up if we don't make this preventive investment now. And we're going to end up paying for it later. Uh, I, I under think so. System. So, so just the number twenty one ninety five is that total cost, or that's just state share, the cost per month. That's total cost. So, this is this is great. So the so the state share is a fourth of that. If you divide the numbers out, let's see. Hang on. Senator Ewing. The cost is a little bit. The cost sorry. is eighteen dollars a day for the state. It's a little bit less because thirty percent of the cost will be state SSBG, which is one hundred percent federal. So it's going to be a little bit less than a quarter. Okay. So even, we blend even in quarter. another federal source. Okay, but even at a quarter of a percent, twenty-five percent, the cost per day. If I'm doing the math right, I took the twenty-one ninety-five times twenty-five percent. Mm -hmm. as the state share divided by 30 days in a month that's $18 a day okay we do not house prisoners for for less than $18 a day no we don't that's okay. correct so so if that is a likely outcome or you can multiply that times the risk factor of that happening mm -hmm. you know you're going to pay more to house them as a prisoner than to support them to get a high school degree so again, the cost of not right. doing anything is higher than the cost of doing something now. And, and we know from the data, from the reports, that if they are, stay with that loving family until they reach uh, that graduation day that they get to have, we know that the number falls 
significantly on those bad numbers that we're number one in. So you're exactly right, $18. I don't know how you do that math so fast. Uh, I have to take off. I have a degree in history, so I have to, was a calculator. Ta I have to take off my shoes and socks to count to 20. I don't know how you do that so quickly. So, But you're right, $18 a day. It's, it's $10 less than what we pay to house prisoners. So, Thank you, Senator. Thank yes, you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Senator Donahue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator Gaddy, do you need do you need two things? You need authorization to be able to do this through legislation, as well as as well as funding. You need both things, or I, I, I think so, because what was brought up in health and welfare was that you know these. If you mean from this aspect, the when the children turn 18, they're no longer wards of the juvenile system. Mm -hmm. They are adults. So we need authorization, we okay. need their consent, and then we need funding to fund it. All right. And, uh, Secretary, do you, uh, let's see, when, uh, there's no way that you, you can absorb this in the agency, depending on what your budget is, or are you concerned? I mean, I know you're concerned about your budget, but uh, with the cuts that are proposed, um, that's not your consideration. Your consideration is, I, I don't mean to put words in your mouth here, <laughs> it seems to me this is your consideration. Um, so if if um, if you were funded as similar to as you were funded last year, is this a cost you can absorb? No, sir. Okay. We are hanging by a thread, members. We tr I, I I know. Well, let me suggest let me suggest this because it's obvious that everybody in the committee is is interested in in trying to figure something out. I, I don't think I don't think this is the place to figure it out. And, and what I would suggest uh, to, to the chairman that you perhaps defer your bill for a week, meet with the chairman and any other the members in this committee and the staff that know how these things are put together and so we can get to Senate Hewitt's $18 a day and, and, and see that if, there, if there's some way to make those numbers work within the parameters of the committee, uh, the parameters of the committee right now are if it's got a fiscal note, we don't let it out of committee. And I think everybody wants to figure out a way to do it, so perhaps there's, there is a way to do it. Yeah, and what I would hate to do is run out of time in this session uh, because it still has to go to the Senate floor, <clears throat> House committee, House floor, um, and if, and even to work if, if, if um, we get the bill passed. Uh, but I don't want to – and one hesitation, and Senator Hewitt, you know, I want to bring this up when I responded to you, and, and Senator Donahue, is that uh, I hesitated on bringing the bill because I knew it would have a note. Mm -hmm. And I knew their department was already strained because we asked them to do so much for, for some of the uh, most vulnerable in our state. So I, I don't mind uh, doing that. I would like for the folks that drove a long way to testify if we yeah, have more time for I'll, that. I'll but, say but this, I, that, you know, that in many cases when a bill has a fiscal note, if you would take your bill with a fiscal note, get together with the chairman and his staff and let them take a look at it, there, there may be ways to – to work these things out that are, are not going to appear here before the committee. So uh, it's just a... And Senator Donnie, just to let you know, I, I did have this discussion with him. He was not going to bring the bill. I asked him to bring the bill anyway, knowing that it would be deferred or that we would put it in our stack until we could figure out a mechanism by which we could fund it and stick to our our ongoing policy, which is not even to fund something like this, at, at least at this point. Well, so. Mr. Chairman, I think I think that was an excellent idea because most of us, maybe, maybe all of us, don't know that this even exists and what the possibilities are. So I think it's it's a wonderful idea, and we just have to figure out how to pay for it. And right now, I, I don't have a way to do that. I don't think any of us do. I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Chairman. Okay, and that's why we that's really why we asked him to ring. It's because I figured no one had – I was under the impression that, just like everybody else, that it that you would they would we had support all the way to whatever twenty one is what I always thought. But anyway, um, Senator Barrow. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And at one point, Mr. Chairman, we used to have support through the age of twenty one. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I forgot exactly what year it was that it rolled back. Uh, thirteen. Thirteen. We lost, to, yeah, we lost the young adult program that yeah. did it. It did not extend. Um, the age of foster care, but it allowed those children to stay connected to us yes. by choice and receive financial support as well as the educational stipend. 
Yeah, so that was 2013, and there was a bridge. And I, I just want to make this quick comment because actually Senator Hewitt stated pretty much what I wanted to say. I just want to say to the committee, I don't know if you remember the four young people that actually interned last year with the department, and many of them came and gave their testimony and how that positive interruption in their life actually took them off on a destructive path. And they talked about some of them, their siblings. Uh, one of the young men that I know, uh, brother, in, is incarcerated. Mm -hmm. um, uh, two sisters uh, that managed to, to move through the program. But they just talked about the tra trauma that they experienced. But because of this program, them having an opportunity to be connected uh, to additional families, in addition to some of them still with their foster care families, they are now all in college. That was the positive interruption in their lives that now have them on a trajectory to actually have a quality of life. And so this to me is, is it, it, it's a small investment on a great return that I think we can expect as a state. And these children deserve it because of no fault of their own, they end up in these situations. And then oftentimes they try to do the best that they can with what they have and what they know to try to become productive citizens. And I believe we owe this to them. So I, I know we all agree. Um, so Mr. Chairman, if I heard point of order, if I heard uh, Senator Donahue correctly, he's asking that we defer this, I mean, or we hold it, or are we going to go ahead and hear it and still try to find the money for this? Well, <clears throat> we don't really have a rule as a committee. We have a rule as a, we have an understanding among committee yes. members. So, I mean, anyone can offer anything at any time for passage. He was not going to bring the bill until we had a discussion about it a few nights ago. And I said, well, I think the committee would want to hear about it. I still don't think they would fund it. And I told him that I would move to defer it or put it in the stack until such time that we figured out um, if we're going to get any revenue measures or if we're going to find any other money or we can identify some. And uh, I, I know I want to be consistent because I know my, I have a bill in that stack. But <laughs> this issue to me surpassed surpass that. But I, I do want to be consistent in order in terms of what we have been trying to stick to uh, as a committee. But we have to find the money for this. That's To me, that's no choice. We have to find it. So somehow, some way, we're going to have to find the money to make sure that we make this work. Right. And I also told him that if there was any one measure that we would create an exception for or he might take extraordinary means, this might be the one. Okay. But again, just for us to try to be consistent. Uh, because we've been consistent even with ourselves, because I know many of you have had bills that got put on the stack. Uh, so, But I think, as you can tell, the test, uh, people see this as an expenditure that may not be, uh, that you know we might take an extra step to figure out what we would do. Thank uh, you, so Mr. I think Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for bringing the bill. Thank you, Madam But, but while you guys are here and you had all these people come in, I'm sorry, question. Senator Alliance got a question. Quick question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, Madam Secretary, how much of the fiscal note are your TOs, and how much is direct payment? There's, I have it here. We have, I think, 24 positions. 24 positions. It's four units, and the unit is four case worker. And so about $2 million of the fiscal note is positions? I should how do much, the math. It's how much money direct is direct match? You mean four? The position? It, it's it's 20 positions. So 20 positions. And, yeah. and it, it anticipates that six, 10 six, children plus benefits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 60 and, that, and that is blended in into the note. Yes. yes. And senators, that's why we can't just absorb this work. Our caseloads are appalling. Uh, Just, and, and I know you know that. Uh, so uh, yeah. if we could absorb it, we would come before you and say, we want you to raise the age legally so that we can continue to do that. Right. We can't absorb it. It's, it's around 1.3 million in salaries. So 1.3 million are the TOs of the match? TOs, like the total position. 1.3 million and, uh, and the rest is the match. No, 1.3 million total, and then you have basically a 20, 25 percent match. That's the right. match. Okay. Thank you. 
I think we can. I think we'll find it and we can let it out anytime. Thank you. Know. Waste, he's right and we have a few people that want to testify that drove a long way. I, I would just defer any other thing. To, or, or, or not, I hate to use the word defer my comments. <laughs> Maybe I'll just pause and, and let these other folks amendment. speak about this, this issue. On? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. So, Senator Allen offers up the amendment that you just. Thank you, Senator Allen. Uh, and uh, you discussed it 22 in the. 2231. 2231, without objection, it's adopted. So you said you have people that will testify now? Okay. There's some that handed in green cards. All right. Yeah, I have a whole stack of cards here. So we'll take those folks up right now. Um, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, my name is Sage Easter. I am from Benton, up in Bossier Parish. I've been a licensed foster parent for about eight years. Uh, the reason I decided to travel down here today to testify was just to put a little bit of a face on this situation. Senator Fannin, I may be able to answer some of the questions that you had specifically. Um, we have a 17-year-old young man that lives with us right now who is in foster care. We got a call about six months ago um, from the agency because the home that he was in uh, was going to not be able to financially carry him to the point of his graduation. He's going to graduate hopefully at age 19. Um, we are a licensed foster family that was willing to keep him in our home past the point that we were being reimbursed by the state. Um, so he has found himself in our home. Uh, because we decided to take this particular teen into um, our family, we've been pegged as that family that takes teens and we keep getting these calls. We can't, we're not um, certified to take any more kids. So um, it has become more and more apparent to me on a weekly basis um, that these teens are aging out with nowhere to go. We got a call a couple of months ago about a young man who was aging out the next day. He did go to a 21-day shelter the next day. They could not find a family, um, even when reaching out to the faith-based community, um, because they don't need to be certified foster parents the day after they turn 18. Um, they just could not find a place to put him. Um, so it's an unfortunate situation. Um, I have two children. Um, that are biological children who are in college right now in the state of Louisiana. They have received the care of a loving family um, their entire life. And when we see these foster kids come in and how they respond to a foster family um, environment that wants to keep them, um, it's amazing the growth that we see in them just in a short amount of time. Um, and fortunately, we are one of the families that has been able to afford to keep this young man, um, but have been made aware of several other situations where that would not work. So we just wanted to put a face on it. The Goodwill program um, that was mentioned where they do get the subsidy, the $500 a month subsidy, if they pass the independent living programs, um, what I have also learned is that there are many foster families who unfortunately are receiving that money that should be going to that child as rent because they are now 18 and the family's not being reimbursed, so they are charging that child rent. So the money that they would have to help them with education or to help them get on their feet, purchase a car or whatever, is actually having to pay the family where they're staying to remain there. And that's an unfortunate situation. Thank you. Senator Fan, you want to wait till the testimony? You want to ask, yeah. ask her a question now? Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ella, and I'm a 17-year-old foster kid. In 2016, my life was a mess, my family was struggling, and honestly, I was out of control. After moving from friend's house to friend's house, I found myself homeless and nowhere left to go. Through no choice of my own, a whole lot of tears and screaming and blaming, I entered the foster care system. I wholeheartedly believed this was temporary and my mom would fix this and I would be back home in a couple of weeks. I believed no one understood and if they would just leave us alone, I could fix this. Truth is, I couldn't fix this. Weeks turned into months and it's now been almost a year and a half. I know in my heart that my mom loves us with everything in her, but she has struggled to get back on her feet. She still does not have a home for us to go to or a job to provide for us. I pray that she is not on the streets and that she is not hungry or lonely. I text her every day to make sure she is safe and knows how much we love her. I pray every night that she is okay and that one day our family will be together again. I know this burden is not mine to bear, but it has always been my mom and I against the world. In October, I will turn 18 years old, and I feel I will have to choose between going help my mom or staying where I am. Do I put my mom first or myself? And how am I supposed to choose between my mom and my baby sister, who is in foster care also? Don't get me wrong, I am not being kicked out or left on my own at 18 like other foster kids I have met. 
I have a family here, and I can stay where I am forever if I wanted to. But at 18 years old, the choice is mine. I want to be with my mom. I want to help her get on her feet. I want to take care of her. Some days, it completely consumes me to think of her out there alone. Other days, I think of how much fun my senior year is going to be with my friends, the basketball games, prom, graduation, senior trip. In six months, I will be 18. Do I choose me or my mom? I so badly want to graduate and go to college, but I am so scared to make the wrong choice. It is even hard putting these thoughts into words and hoping you all understand. I was a year behind and failing the ninth grade when I entered CARE. I am now in 10th grade making A's and B's and taking extra classes to graduate in 2019. I am also on the varsity cheer and track team for my high school. This has not been an easy road for me, and I still struggle every day to feel like I belong. But I am not ready to age out. I am not ready to choose between these two lives. I am not ready to give up or move on. I am here today to give you a face behind the words and numbers on the bill in front of you. There are some foster kids who are ready to face the world and these choices at 18, but there are some who are not. I'm behind in school, and even with extra classes, I will not be done by 18 years old. I want the opportunity to graduate high school. I want the support and guidance of my foster family, my workers, and my counselors just a little bit longer. I want them there when I walk across the stage with my diploma. I want my mom to see me make something of myself, but I don't trust myself to do this on my own. Increasing the age of youth exiting the system will give kids like me a little bit longer to finish school and grow a little, a little bit longer. Most importantly, it will give us a chance to find our place in the world without the burden of choosing between what we have and what we have left behind. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, my name's Joan Lawsang. I'm a foster parent from St. Martin Parish, and um, a few months ago, well, probably a year and something now, I picked up Ella on the side of the road. <laughs> She was one of the homeless. Um, I have a sto I, I prepared a bunch of stories or whatever, but I can just tell you from the heart, I've seen so many Ellas come through my home. I can name them. I can tell you their stories because they're all here. I don't usually cry. I'm sorry. Their stories are all the same. They've come from rough times, and they just need that chance. I can tell you Zach's story, and Michael's story, and Tyler's, and I have, maybe it's aging out in three days. I can tell you his story, and how it will end. But I want to tell you that maybe the state doesn't track their kids, but as false moms, we do. We keep track of them. We help them any way we can. Thank you. I'm sorry. All right. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Uh, Senator Fannin, before you leave. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. L let me say uh, to you that it's emotional for y'all, but it's emotional for us, too. It really is. The, the part I'm struggling a, a little bit with, and uh, again, I commend you. Look, I want every child, I'm a, I'm a school teacher from many, many years ago, so I want every child to get an education. That's how you lift yourself up uh, in, in society. What I'm struggling with, <laughs> you're here today as foster parents. But I have them come into my office, and single moms, that's not participating in the foster care. But they're almost like foster children out there. The mom is trying to raise a family and is struggling to keep them in school. And, and, and they're struggling because they don't get any additional support like a foster parent does. Foster parents are really, I guess, awards of the state to some degree. I don't know how the laws uh, really do. I mean, but, but, our, but our local officials try their best not to remove children from pam 
uh, from parents. They, they go out of the way not to do that. But at the same time, we have single moms that, that just struggle. And the point I'm trying to get to is that a lot of those things that we will be faced with financially in this session, we, we were, not, we're not able to finance everything, even though we, we really want to. Those, those moms that come to my office, and, you, and if you go to a, to a school, a high school, and you visit with parents and guide, I mean with principals and guidance counselors, they struggle with this continually. And, and parents, moms move their child from one school three times a year for, uh, to, to, to different schools. It's, it's, the, it's an issue, it's a societal issue. I don't have the answers to it. But I got to try to figure out how to be fair with all moms and, uh, and, and, and to my, balance it. My yeah. response to that would be that these kids, we're not asking for help for us, for the right. moms. These kids are wards of the state and the response. Yeah, and, and they are a ward. They have been, they, I understand, and they, there is a difference. I mean, we, 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 there, there's a difference here in this building, but when I go back home in my office and have to deal with that, uh, with with that parent, there's really not a lot of difference. Uh, to to be honest with you, deep down in your heart, uh, there's not. So I appreciate you being here. I want to commend the young lady. Uh, keep keep your head up, and and get your education, and 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 you'll do well. I, I can see that already. And and that's all, Mr. Chairman. Now I understand we know what we're going to do at least temporarily with the bill, but uh, to to let you know we struggle constantly and will with with the issues that we see here emotionally on the next bill sit down just say recognize go ahead i'm sorry uh, senator johns good thank you mr chairman and and ella i just want to thank you for being here today i know that took a lot of courage for you to come but I want you to know you're not representing just Ella. You're representing thousands of young people across the state, and you've told their story incredibly well this morning. Thank so uh, you, not only to you, but every one of you uh, foster children that are here this morning, there's some incredible opportunities out there for you, and take advantage of those. And, 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 and you, you, you have so much to offer life out there. So um, thank you for, for being here. And to every foster parent that's here today, thank you. I have an adopted daughter. My only child is adopted. And so I've been very involved in adoptions and foster care and those types of things. But uh, there's just, um, it's a special place. Uh, you have a special place in, in God's heart for the work that you're doing. So thank you all very, very much. So good luck to you. Okay. Thank you. Senator Barrow. I just want to uh, commend the uh, foster parents, and I, I want to thank Ella as well. But I just want to tell you thank you so very much for opening up your home and opening up your heart to be a positive interruption on an otherwise destructive path for these young people. So I just want to say thank you. Senator Ali. No, no. I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry. Uh, I was okay. there's more of us if y'all want more <laughs> um, yeah while you're here uh, you know okay uh, my name is Cherie bro I'm from Lafayette and I have been fostering for seven years I've had 32 kids come in my house hope is my daughter she's the second 16 year old that I adopt so they are not aging out but she wanted you to know her story she's too scared to tell it but she wants you to know it <laughs> um, we I met hope seven years ago and she was in our house as a foster child for one week and I was a new foster parent and she was a hot mess and we sent her back and God decided that was not enough he kept crossing our paths and last year we adopted her in the meantime um, I started a nonprofit to help kids aging out and we can't do enough we can help four kids at a time and as I think there's 190 aging out this year like we can't do it we as foster parents are doing what we can some of us are keeping these kids after 18 um, but if you are able to fund it where all the foster parents can continue being an option we can help a lot more of these kids and as you guys noted 
if they age out, it's going to cost us more if we don't help them now. Um, Seventy percent, as things stand now, 70 percent will go to jail, prostitution, human trafficking, unwanted pregnancies, or drugs. That's going to cost us more. Um, in the years, Hope, Hope spent eight years in foster care. She went to 36 homes, 17 schools that I can count on her transcripts. She failed four grades and skipped two. Who does that make sense to? She's had nobody, no consistency in education. She's had no consistency in medical. She came to me with a list of diagnoses this long. She's taken two pills now. She is not, she was completely over medicated. Com every time she had a temper tantrum, she was given a new diagnosis. Well, she wasn't really in places where she was getting what she needed. Now that she's settled and she has a home, um, she, we realize now that she is, has Asperger's, this one undiagnosed till last year. So she's been trying to go through school with no, I mean, basically moving every three months, if you average it out. She's moved every quarter for eight years um, with an undiagnosed autism and severe dyslexia. She probably reads on a third grade level. She can't move out when she turns 18. She can't be on her own. I mean, and thank God she won't be because she's been adopted. She's in a family, but that's what she was looking at. And that's what so many of these kids are looking at. I think she'll answer questions, but she just don't want to prepare anything. <laughs> Do you have anything you want to share with us while you're here? The main thing that scared me is that I had an older brother. He aged out, and the system said that we won't support him. You can just throw him out. You just do what now? Throw him out. Okay. And and that is, a, I mean, I've heard specific stories on their 18th birthdays. They're out. If they need a ride somewhere, they better go at 17 and 364 days because funding stops when they turn 18. They don't have a ride when they're 18. And this, her brother was forced to get a GED. He was not allowed to finish high school because his foster family was not going to keep him past, past not, his 18th birthday because the check stopped. And that's unfortunately the case in some places. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm in support of extending the age of foster care and with some stipulations. One of them would be an ongoing trade school, a education of some kind. Less than 2% of these kids go to college, and there's many scholarships available to them if they have the family support and they are the key to breaking the cycle so we are dependent on the state support it's not easy being a foster care is not a child it's certainly not easy being a foster parent it's also um, an awesome privilege to be a foster parent and it's heartbreaking and I know you guys have heard the stories so that I am a little emotional and uh, I, I, um, I wanted to speak because uh, Senator Fannin said something about the people that come in and they need support. In my experience, this is just me, the biological parents get tons of support more than the foster parents. That's just my experience. Um, also, uh, uh, the secretary said something about independent living. The independent living classes that are available to these kids are sadly lacking, and I recommend that at the least this committee does is go back to funding the contract that they had prior to 2015. Um, at least the kids had the option of going to a class, balancing a checkbook, cooking and stuff. That's no longer available. Uh, when the child went to school, they could have a counselor, you know, parents can't go hand-holding to college. They had an independent living contractor that would help them with what they needed to succeed. Uh, that is no longer anything that I've seen, and you could correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. But um, I would, at the smallest point, extend it to 19. And it has to be mutual. Can you come forward toward the microphone? I'm sorry. It has to be mutual between the child and the foster family. And there's, there's a lot of awesome awesome kids with so much potential so I appreciate you guys um, letting us speak I just can, I'm sorry I just wanted to ask you if you'd identify um, yourself for the I'm record Esther Perkins, um, at the microphone please. I've been a, a foster parent for five years 
and I foster mostly adolescents and uh, I had a heart attack this past fall and I have not been fostering anybody since then but I'm still quite active as far as supporting the kids that do age out and uh, it's it's complicated in our society as well just because you provide a safe clean environment doesn't mean that you're going to have safe environments but we really are the key to changing the cycle and most most families do need that support I just wanted to add to the comment about the parents the birth parents that have issues I mean my mom was a single mom and we lived hand to mouth and 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 that is a real issue but those kids have their mom it's a whole nother ball game when you're your own person with no family if they are aging out there is nobody in their family that's good enough or willing to take them in they have no family these kids that are dragging around behind their moms they are having a hard life but they have their mom and I had a hard childhood but I had my mom and I still have her and that it's just a totally different thing to think of being all alone at 18. When I moved out at 19, I was ready. I went home every weekend and did my laundry and had my meal. You know, they don't have that. I think that's an important distinction. All right, thank you, uh, ladies. Do we have anybody else testifying? Okay. I'm Barbara Colley. I'm president of the uh, Louisiana Foster Parent Association. Um, extending the age to 19, it's a plus, but extending to 23 is, would be, you know, far better. And I say this because when you look at uh, Teenagers coming into care, what about them? And I mean, they are, you're getting like maybe uh, a 16 year old plus who is expected to go to school and do well, but look at where the child comes from. And even if you are working with the bios, you know, which is good, and I am in favor of working with the biological family because I feel that together, you know, we can help the child, but then if the child has been away from the bios, they have both are suffering from trauma, so you're working together, it's true, but then with the extended time, maybe the three years, if given three years to work together and help the child. So the child is still in care. We are helping the mom and we are also helping that child. So it's, it's a help help situation. And then maybe you can get other family members involved. And I hear that, yes, it is a problem, not only in the foster care system, that there are parents out there, maybe single parents who are struggling, but we are all struggling. But at the end of the day, it is about that child. So we don't wanna forget the 16 plus year old. We don't want to, you know, I know it has to begin somewhere, and I understand that, yes, money is a problem, but the children are in state custody, and it is unfair to the children just to say, well, you are 18, and now it's time to go, when they have had trauma from the beginning or maybe for many years. But together, I know, even with the bio, we can work together. So whatever can be done to help the children, I'm asking, please try. One year will help, but 23 would really be a blessing. Thank you. 
Senator Gaddy, uh, as I conclude all the testimony for today. Yep. I'm sorry. I believe so, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Madam Secretary, you have you want to add something to it before we uh, before Mr. Gaddy, uh, Senator Gaddy closes? I just want to thank you for your compassion and your um, belief and understanding in what the system faces. I wish there were no bad foster care stories to come before you. We are working every day to make every children's experience better. But you can see from the testimony in front of you that we've got a long way to go. But I appreciate your um, listening and hearing what these people had to say yeah. today. Yeah. All right, Senator Gaddy, you thank you. Just close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your time. And if, if all the folks here in the fo that work in the foster system or you're a foster parent, if you've been a foster child, or if you are a foster child, would you stand right now if you're here today? Can we just give them a, a warm round of applause? Uh, uh, you know, when you, draft a bill, when you draft a bill like this, you don't know if anybody's going to show up. So I left Bozier at 5 o'clock this morning and drove in, and I knew Sage would be here. And when I met Ella and I met Hope, I realized why we have to do this bill. You know, I'll, I'll just make my closing short. Uh, Senator White, would you, would you pull out that flag right there, that Louisiana flag, just so we can see what's on it? You know? Now, I want to tell you all those that now this flag is different than most flags you will see. You know, the story of our state flag is about a mama pelican, and she's out in the swamp, and she can't find any food for her children, okay? So she begins to pluck the feathers from her breast to feed these babies. But there's something different about the flag in this room. This is the old version. That's the old version right, because there are no drops of blood you see, the reason the flag was designed as a mile pelican, because it's a rare breed of bird, it will give of itself for its children. Most animals do not do that. They abandon the weak. Do you see? So the flag used to have drops of blood because the saying was, our state has a lot of poor people in it, but it has people that are willing to sacrifice for them. So the mama pelican had three drops of blood. If you're a Christian, the three chicks and the three drops of blood are equivalent to three days in the tomb and three in the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, and things like that. So, so three even was symbolic in our flag to remind us because we have a lot of reminders around this building about who we serve and what we're supposed to do. But for a while, someone said, I'm offended by those drops of blood. I want them off the flag. Because, see, the story was the state was willing to sacrifice to take care of the weakest. And they didn't like the fact that those drops of blood were on the flag reminding everybody who we were really here to serve. And it wasn't until about a decade ago that someone caught the mistake. Representative Baldone from Homa. I knew you would know. And it's always somebody from Homa that catches that kind of stuff. <laughs> but they caught and they said, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Our state is about helping the poorest among us first. And then with the leftover, we can help everyone else. And so luckily, the drops of blood from the Mama Pelican were placed back on our flag as a reminder that it hurts to do the right thing. And that the people you're helping, those baby chicks, they don't even know you're doing it for them. And it's tough because you're the one making the sacrifice. Well, that's flip. We're asking these children now to make a sacrifice. And that's what's wrong. We can't abandon them. You see, the flag also, the pelican with outstretched arms with those drops of blood, remind us right here, right after Easter, of Christ on the cross making the ultimate sacrifice. You see, these foster parents that are here today, they are mama pelicans. You know that? The least we can do is come alongside them and try to help them. I wasn't going to put all that on you all today, but Ella is a cheerleader, and she led me to cheer for her today. And Hope is a child of hope. She didn't have hope before going to 36 schools. I even know her story till today. It's the least we can do is pluck some feathers where it hurts and feed these babies what they need. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Gaddy. Senator Torver? The flag you was talking about was put together by Democrats. 
That was put together by Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you don't have a drop of blood on it. <laughs> you, you had to go there. We're probably, I had to go there. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> as you've told me to say, no offense, but we're going to edit that from the video. Okay? <laughs> edit, that will not be on Facebook later, I promise you. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Uh, Senator Gaddy, I think we're going to have a mechanism to fund it uh, right after this bill, uh, right after you leave the table. We ha I have another bill that I think we can modify in such a way to fund it. Thank you. Um, I, I want to thank each of you for your time in this, and, uh, and uh, you know, this is a tough issue. It's a very tough issue for our children, and, but I don't think there's any other demographic you're going to look at where the crystal ball is clearer about if we don't do it, something bad's going to happen. So thank you for your time. God bless uh, and you. so with that, before I do that, so I'll offer up Amendment 2233, which would state, uh, which says if Senate Bill 555 passes, then your bill um, would have sufficient funding. And so the funding mechanism would be to take uh, $961,000 of the $53 million that's annually provided for in the BP settlement to pay for this program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know all the foster families and all the foster children appreciate that. So, 2250. I'm sorry. It's a statutory dedication, Senator uh, Senator Hewitt. <laughs> and and we will all come before your Senator Hewitt will all come before your subcommittee to uh, justify this dedication. <laughs> oh, it's a direct appropriation. That's what it would be. So it's not. It it, it goes around uh, the committee there, Senator Hewitt. I tell you, we take extraordinary means if necessary. <laughs> so, does anybody have any objection to this amendment? No. So, if there's no objection, that amendment will be adopted. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and I know all the foster families appreciate y'all's work today. And then we can bring your bill back up if, assuming 555 passes today. Thank you. And of course, we would direct the uh, one million dollars or 961 thousand to take care of the foster program foster care program foster care program is coming off the top because you can't issue right. as you know uh, tax exempt bonds it's got to come right off the first law. part right is that good with everybody so the stream would be do, reduced uh, by 961,000 the balance that would be used to fund these to fund this program so how do we adopt a conceptual amendment without a number? Uh, yeah. Can we, we have numbers on both of them. That would never go away. Either. Okay. Can you all give us a Add number, to, Martha, that we would, the chairman Have we adopted could, the amendment? So whatever that, whatever that number is. and that Whatever that be, one is, right. Yeah. Uh, amendment 2233 is the amendment to fund an amount sufficient to fulfill the state match requirement of Senate Bill 129 of the 2018 regular session and that comes off the top before you securitize, you securitize okay. I believe that's and the intent of what we, where we put it okay well then I have, have I offered that amendment yet uh, it, no. we have not adopted it so I would like to withdraw that amendment and resubmit it with the following provisions that one hundred million dollars be allocated to the time program associated with the highway that Senator Donahue just described. Thirty-two forty-one. Thirty-two forty-one, and that none of the proceeds be used for any of the roads associated with Garvey. Yes, sir. Okay. Do we have an amendment number? The floor uh, moves that we adopt amendment number what 20, 30, 2233 uh, as as added to in concept by staff. Is there any objection to adopting that amendment? Okay. Question by Senator Fan. Uh, not not a question on the on the hundred that that, that we do it, but a question on the we'll just call it a million for the foster. Well, it's not going to be a million. It's going to be yes, yeah, nine hundred, uh, whatever that number is. I'm just using a rounded number for the purpose. 
that we're going to securitize these for so many years, right? What happens to that? I mean, are we saying that there's always got to be enough money in that fund to take care of that nine hundred something it's, thousand? It's not going to be in a fund. It's it's coming off the stream itself as it comes in. That money is allocated and but, appropriated to. And this it will program. come in for how many years? Fifteen, huh? fifteen years. So at oh, that for point, fifteen years. Yeah. At that point, then it concludes that nine hundred and something thousand. Right. Would we'll, be. we'll have to appropriate it every year. It's yeah. not a. We got to do this every year. Yeah. It's not a. It's not a statutory dedic. It's not a statutory dedication. It's. Okay. It's an annual stream of money that we look at just as anything else in the general fund. And this year we're going to fund it, and I am assuming we'll fund it in the years out as well. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Bachier. Okay. The board is clear. Uh, on a motion by Senator Lafleur, that we. Uh, uh, report House Bill five, I mean Senate Bill 555 uh, as amended. Uh, is there any objection? Hearing no objection, that bill is reported favorably. Uh, on thank you, members. We have no other. It, it. Oh, well now we can. That's right. Now we can pass Gaddy's bill. Okay. Senate. Okay. Uh, bringing back up on a motion by the chairman, uh, Senate Bill 129, by Senator Gatti, to report that bill favorably as amendment as amended. Is there any objection to reporting that bill favorably as as amended? Hearing none. Uh, Senate Bill 129 is reported favorably as amended. 